Good morning, Mosaic. It is so great to be here with you this morning, and thank you for being here with us on today. I'm Lawrence Hicks, one of the pastors here. So whether you're here in person or tuning in with us from online, we are so glad that you are here, and we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for worshiping with us on, on today. We thank um, Brother Aaron for leading us in our, in our praise and worship time. Those who are here, please, let's give our worship team a big round of applause for leading us in worship on today. It has been such a, a sweet, sweet worship experience. So we do, once again, thank you for being here with us on today. There are so many that are here in person. Our children's church started back up today. So let's give a big round of applause for, for that. Pastor Lauren is right next door leading our children in, in children's worship. So it is just a great, great Sunday. So today we're going to continue uh, walking through the book of Nehemiah. We've been walking through Ezra and Nehemiah for the past couple, two or three weeks. I believe this is our third week of this series. The series is called Come Forward, Courage to Rebuild. And it's a survey of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that prior to the, 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 the canon being put together, they were actually one book and, and, and then they were separated out into two separate books. Pastor Mark, in the first week, he led us through Ezra and Nehemiah overview. And then last week, Pastor Harry took the first chapter of Nehemiah and walked us through uh, repentance last week. Last week was our Repentance Sunday. And today, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapters 2 through 4. 2 through 4. And just as a little bit of background, is today we're going to be talking about trusting God in prayer and action here in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, the people of God had been in captivity, Babylonian captivity for a long time. They had come out of Babylonian captivity, and now they were living within the Persian Empire. So the, 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 the old country, if you will, the old kingdom had not been rebuilt, and that's where we're going to pick up at. Nehemiah is a high official in the king's court, the Persian king at Xerxes. He's the, the king's cupbearer. And we're going to pick up on a conversation that Nehemiah is having with the king on today. We're going to get into that in chapter 2, verse 1, but let us pray as we go to God, as we hear from heaven. So, Lord, we just give you thanks on this day. We pray, Lord God, that you would just speak to us and speak through us, that we would receive all that you have for us on this day. I pray for your people who are online, those who are viewing the live stream, Facebook Live, and those under the sound of my voice here in the building, I pray that you would just richly bless each one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So trusting God in prayer and action. Prayer and action. Because sometimes, especially I've, I've heard a lot about people saying, well, if you prayed and you don't need to act, or if you act, you don't need to pray. No, today we're going to look at both, because there is a partnership, there is a relationship between prayer and action. It is not a either or. Today we're going to be talking about both and. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter one, or chapter two, I'm sorry, starting with verse one, and it reads as follows. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. That's Nehemiah there saying that, that, that he was afraid. So here he is in the presence of the king. He's the king's cupbearer. And Nehemiah's mind and heart, as we're going to see, is on his home people and his home country. And the king notices that Nehemiah, is, is his, his, his countenance is downcast. He's seeing sad. And this is actually a risk on Nehemiah's part by showing his sadness in the presence of the king. Because during that time, you really weren't allowed to be sad in front of the king or the queen. You always had to present a, a happy face. But the king noticed it. And the king asked him, said, why are you so sad? He said, why is your heart so, so downcast? And that's why Nehemiah was afraid because the king could have had him put to death because he was, in, he was uh, showing a sad face in front of the king. 
So let's look at what he says in verse 3. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Verse 4. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? What are you requesting, Nehemiah? What are you asking for? I hear what you're saying about your hometown, your home country, your people. What are you requesting? Now, to put that into context, just imagine if Governor Asa Hutchison walked in here right now and said to you, what do you need? You're looking a little down and despondent. What do you need in your life right now? I could think of a whole lot of things. I need a tax break, Governor. I need a new truck. I need a uh, new motorcycle. Um, I need another dog. My dog's getting on my nerves. Um, I need a, a new roof on the house. I could think of a million things. If the governor were to come in here and ask me, I could think of a million things to request from the governor. And that's what King Artaxerxes was doing here. He was saying, what are you requesting? But unlike me, Nehemiah did something that we need to take note of here. Right in that next verse, Nehemiah, he says what? He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. That's significant. He doesn't just blurt out what he wants or what's on his mind or what's on his heart. He doesn't ask for a new house, a new car, a new mule, a new horse, or anything like that. Anything that the king could have given him, Nehemiah prayed to the God of heaven. So even though the king was asking him, what, what do you need? Nehemiah spoke to God before he replied to the king. He prayed to God first, and then verse 5, he talks to the king secondly. In verse 5, he said, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. That, was, that is what was in his heart, what God had put into his heart, to rebuild the city and to rebuild the walls, to rebuild Jerusalem. Verse 6, And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be, be gone and when will you return? I thought it was kind of funny that uh, that's there in uh, parentheses there, the queen sitting beside him. It's like the king, like, like, yeah, you can go. But the queen was like, well, how long is he going to be gone? <clears throat> You know, you're just going to be sending all the help away. So the queen, so the queen was sitting there beside him. Uh, uh, king at Xerxes asked Nehemiah, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time or a, or a time frame. Verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem. The king blessed him to go and he says, so I went to Jerusalem, and was there three days. Verse 12, then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. So we're talking about rebuilding. Here is Nehemiah going back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city to rebuild the walls of, to, of the city specifically. Right now, we are sitting in this time in 2020 where it seems like we have so much in our nation and in our world that needs to be rebuilt. Some of us are sitting here right now in the presence of God, in the presence of other believers. Our countenance is, is, is downcast. We're feeling dejected because we have Sickness, we have hurt, we have pain. There are some things in our lives that need to be rebuilt. And there are some things that God has put into your heart and my heart for us to rebuild. But the key thing is, we got to do like Nehemiah. First, we have to speak with God. Then we have to go to the king. And then we have to move out on it, just like Nehemiah is doing right here in verses 11 and 12. He talked to God. He talked to the king. Verse 12 says, he arose in the night, I, and how many men? Few. Few men. He told how many people what God had put into his heart? No one. 
There are times when you are rebuilding in your life, in your marriage, in your community, in your home, where you don't have the luxury of telling everybody what's going on. You don't have the luxury of trying to take everyone with you on the journey that God has you going on. Like Nehemiah, we have to be discerning of the few that God wants to put around us to help us walk through this and do this work of rebuilding in our lives, in our homes, in our communities. And sometimes you can't tell anyone what God has put into your heart. There may not be a campaign slogan. There may not be a theme that you can rally behind. There won't be a billboard. There won't be any social media. There won't be any fanfare. Few men, and he told no one what God had put into his heart. And as I thought about that, I was like, why did Nehemiah do this? Why did God put in his heart but something great to do, but God did not tell him to broadcast it to the world. One thing that Nehemiah did here that we can take note of is that Nehemiah sought counsel and not confirmation. You can get confirmation from just about anyone, but you can only get counsel from a few. You can get confirmation from anyone. You can get anyone to agree with you in your position, what you're doing, what you're saying, how you're feeling, but you can only get counsel from men and women of God. And we have to be careful as believers as to whether we are seeking confirmation or counsel. Sometimes on social media, we will post things about how we're feeling, how we're doing, how our boss did us wrong, how somebody's getting on my nerves, how my dog is acting up, and all of this kind of stuff. And we're, all we are looking for is confirmation. We're not necessarily looking for counsel on how to deal with the people and the situation. That's why Nehemiah prayed to God before he replied to the king. Some of us need to do the same thing. Sometimes we need to pray to God before we respond to our bosses. We need to pray to God before we respond to our wife, our husband, before we deal with our kids. Now I know what my mama was talking about. Lord, help me. I'm going to kill him, Lord. If She was counseling with God through her teeth with a clenched mouth. Lord, please help me. I don't want to hurt him but I'm going to, it hurt anyway, but Nehemiah sought counsel and not confirmation. There's wisdom in counsel, not so much in confirmation. And so that second chapter kind of closes out with, 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 with Nehemiah. He's going back to Judah, Jerusalem. He's going to get, he wants to get started on the work. He's scouting out the area. And then in Nehemiah chapter 3, it begins the narrative of rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the city. And the thing about chapter 3, we're not going to step through all of it, but in chapter 3, as you read through it, it will definitely say that everyone worked. It lists out every single person, clan, leader of a family who worked in the rebuilding of the city and the rebuilding of the wall. Everyone worked. Rebuilding is everyone's job. It's not just the governor, it's not just the president, it's not just the pastor. Everyone has to help rebuild when we're talking about rebuilding lives and rebuilding a community. Everyone has a responsibility. You talk about rebuilding a relationship. I remember about 20 years ago, my wife and I, it might have been more than 20, roughly 20 years ago, my wife and I, we were on real rocky times. And she was like, Lawrence, I'm going to leave you. And I was like, I can't wait till you leave. It was just bad. It was bad. But she said, because I stood up and made a vow before God and before my family, I'm going to stay here and start rebuilding this relationship. But she could not do that on her own. I had to come along beside her and say, yes, baby, I love you. I want to rebuild this relationship. It took both of us. It took everyone in the relationship working in order to rebuild our home and rebuild our marriage. And that's what was going on here in Judah and Jerusalem. 
everyone had to work to rebuild this country, this nation, this people, this community, these families, these people. And work takes energy. It takes effort. It takes, you don't always have the enthusiasm to do what you need to do, but you got to keep working. Rebuilding is straight up hard work. It's hard work. I said in the first service that oftentimes rebuilding is harder than building. Because when you build something from the ground up, you have no other obstructions. But if you take a house, a building that has been torn down, that has been burned down, there are some things that you got to go in and clear out first before you can rebuild. And that's what was happening here in Jerusalem, that the city was in ruin, so they were going to have to go in and clear some stuff out, do the hard work of clearing so that they could rebuild, and that took everyone, everyone. I thought it was kind of, as you see there, that last bullet, that as they repaired and rebuilt, they rebuilt the, repaired the doors, the bolts, and the bars in verses 13 and 14. I thought it was pretty peculiar that the scripture, that God took care to acknowledge that they not only rebuilt the walls, but they rebuilt the doors, not only rebuilt the doors, but they put bolts on the doors, not only put bolts on the doors, but they put bars on the doors, you know, it makes you wonder what neighborhood they lived in. But there is something to, that we can learn from that. Just like I gave you the example of me and my wife Liz rebuilding our marriage, when we rebuilt, we had to put up doors, bolts, and bars in our marriage because a door is to keep something in or out, keep something out that is, that is an enemy, keep someone in to keep them safe, but it doesn't do any good to just have a door. You got to have a lock on the door. You don't just have to have a lock on the door. You need to have a bolt on the door to keep your family and yourself safe. And that's the same thing that they were doing. They were trying to keep out the enemies that meant them harm and to keep the people of God inside to keep them safe. So as we rebuild our homes, our relationships, and our communities, we have to put up spiritual doors bolts, and bars. We have to have the Word of God in our home. That's a door. We have to have bolts. That's prayer. And we have to have bars. That's the action or the work of, of doing what you need to do to keep your home as it should be. Now, anybody that tells you, if you ain't married yet, if you're married, you know this, but if you ain't married yet, anybody tells you that, that, that the marriage is all sunshine and flowers, they, you better run because they are lying. It ain't all sunshine and flowers. It ain't all rain either. Some days are just partly cloudy. But that's life. That is, that is, that, 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 that's life. So you have got to have doors, bolts, and bars in your relationship with God, in your relationship with the other in your home, community, and your family. All right, let's hu hustle on here. Let's go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, now when Sambalot heard that we were building the wall, this is Nehemiah speaking, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. So, you know, haters going to hate. Verse 2, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? So Sambalot was just hating on the the, 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 the Jewish people, because they were trying to rebuild. Something about it stirred up in him that he did not like. And it even goes on down. If you look at verse 3, it says, Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Haters going to hate. And that's why you can't tell everybody what you're doing. You can't tell, you can't bring everyone into your circle. You can't give everyone what God has given to you in terms of what you should be doing for yourself, for your family, because they are going to be the naysayers. They're going to be the ones that try to tear down what you are building, just like Sambalot 
Tobiah and others during, during that time. And that's also why we should seek counsel and not confirmation. Because if Nehemiah was looking for confirmation from these two, he wasn't going to get it. If he was looking for counsel from these two, he was not going to get it. They were naysayers. And sometimes you just have to ignore the naysayers in your life and go back to the word and the purpose that God gave you. Verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, God had come in and worked some things out on Nehemiah and, and the people of, um, of uh, Judah's hand, on, on their behalf, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Verse 16, from that day on, and this is because they had enemies, people trying to destroy their work, Nehemiah said, half of my servants worked on construction, half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. So people will say, well, what, 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 and I'm pretty sure the people ask Nehemiah, do we fight the enemies or do we build? Nehemiah said, yes. We're going to do both. So he splits up his workforce. Half of them worked on construction, and the other half took up arms. And I like what verse 17 says. He said, those who carry burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon in the other. Got a hammer in one hand and a spear or a shield in the other, ready to work and war. It takes both sometimes. It takes both a lot of times. If your name is Lawrence Six, it takes both all of the times. Do I fight or do I build? Nehemiah says you do both. Do I pray or do I act? Both. Prayer and action. And I like what Nehemiah said up in verse 14 before he even got down to that part. He said, he looked around at the people, he had looked and rose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, and I don't have this on the screen, I'm sorry. He said, he said about the enemies, he said, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So Nehemiah is telling them, remember the Lord God and remember who sent you to fight, who sent you to rebuild, and also remember who you are fighting and rebuilding for. I had to think about that in my own life. I was telling you about the rocky time that me and Liz went through in, in our life, and it was, it, was, it was so, so hard. I look back now, I can't believe that God brought us through that. But I still remember laying on the floor at home one day, Liz wasn't there with me. It was just our youngest son there. He was a little toddler. And I'm just laying on the floor, just crying my eyes out, just, 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 just literally wishing that my life would end. And my son came over, crawled over to me, and he just, I'm laying on the floor face up, and he just started, Daddy, Daddy, are you okay? You okay, Daddy? Started wiping my tears away. It was at that moment in time that I knew that I had to fight for my family. I had to fight for my relationship with my wife. That I had to fight so that my kids could grow up in a stable home. I had to fight most of all because I loved that woman so much that I couldn't bear to do this life without her. So yeah, it took some prayer, but it took a lot of fighting also. So I just want to encourage you today to remember the Lord and remember who you are fighting and rebuilding for. Remember the Lord and remember who you are fighting and rebuilding for. It is worth it. And the next thing I want to encourage you in, is it fighting, is it, you know, or praying, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it faith, is it works, is it prayer, is it action, it is both. The work that God has called us to do is not either or, it's both and. It is faith and it's works. Just like Nehemiah, it's prayer and it's action. 
A lot of times in today's culture, society, it, it, our, 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 our culture is an either or. You know, you, you either drive a Ford or a Chevy. You can't have both in your driveway. You ride a Harley or a Kawasaki. You're a Democrat or a Republican. You're black or you're white. You know, either or. And sometimes it's both and. People look at me, they're like, oh, Lawrence, you're an African-American. I'm like, yeah, kind of. I'm both and. My great-great-grandfather was a Confederate soldier for the, yeah, for the South. Yes. <laughs> I'm both and. It's not either or. And that's what we have to realize. There's a slight, there's a small nuance when it comes to both and that, 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 that we really need to grab a hold of. And that's what God is showing Nehemiah, that it takes both of them. It takes faith. It takes works. It takes prayer. It takes action. It's, it's very, very nuanced. And our society is quickly losing the nuance of both and. Yes, God cares about the child in the womb. He also cares about the people living out here behind the church. Yes, God loves people in this country. He loves the people in Papua New Guinea also. Faith and works. Prayer and action. James 1.17. James says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Dead. Faith is good. Prayer is good. But there's got to be some action and some works to go along with it. How many of y'all remember the Flintstones? The thing that used to intrigue me about the Flintstones was Fred Flintstone's car. Because he would jump in that car, him and Barney Rubble. They didn't have to hit a button or nothing. They would have to do what? Start paddling their feet, start working their feet. It would not do Fred or Barney a bit of good to jump in their car and just sit there and say, this is good enough. I'm sitting in the car. Nope, that would have been dead. They had to put some works to go along with that faith that they were in the car. And that's the same way it is in our lives. We have to put some work, some effort into what we are doing for the kingdom of God. Faith and works. Or otherwise, it's dead. God is, I would argue today, he is a both and God. Yes, he gives us choices of either or, but a lot of times he is both and. Because I am a sinner and I'm saved by grace. I was once on my way to hell and now I am on my way to heaven to live with Jesus forever. Both and. Both and. Prayer and action. We trust God through prayer and action. Faith and works. We believe and we confess. Where I'm from, down south of Arkansas, the old folks used to say, you watch, fight, and pray. You do all three. Watching is good. Praying is good. Fighting is good. I got a lot of cousins that love to fight. But either one of those by themselves just does not stand. You have to do all two or three of those. Watch, fight, and pray. Because that's the kind of God we serve. We serve a both and kind of God. He lives in heaven and he lives in our hearts. He loves me and he loves you. He came and died and he rose again. He went away and he's coming back. He is a just God and at the same time, he's merciful. He is good and he's kind. The old folks used to say he sits high and he what? Looks low. He is our king, and at the same time, he's our savior. He's our bridegroom, and we are his bride. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture.
I don't know what you may be dealing with today in your home, in your family, in your community, but God is just encouraging you today to not only to pray, but to fight. Remember who and what you are fighting for on today, Mosaic. Remember why you're fighting. God has put something into your heart. It may be a vision. It may be a vision for your family. It may be something that hadn't yet come to pass where you need to continue to pray about it, but also you need to continue to work towards that. Because the enemy is not going to just give up fighting you, fighting against you. And some of us sitting right here today and some of us online have some things in our lives that have been torn down. We've got situations, we've got relationships that have been torn down, that have been strained. God wants to rebuild them. He wants to rebuild them through prayer and through your actions of doing the mending of those relationships. So as Pastor Harry gets ready to come forward and lead us through a short time of prayer, and Pastor Alex is going to do the same online, if you have never accepted the Lord through his son, Jesus Christ, we invite you today to believe and to confess that Jesus is Lord. Prayer and action because he is a both and kind of God. We love you and may God bless you and keep you.